to good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Ivan. My name is Cody and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. Before we dive into things, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review with everyone. First of all, we are recording today's session. So if you miss any of our discussion, if you'd like to rewatch, or if you'd like to share with your team, you will be receiving the on-demand recording via email shortly after we conclude this live session today. Now, if you'd like to engage with us, there are a couple of ways to do so. For general thoughts or comments, we want you to use the chat tab, which is found on the right side of your screen. So when you do find that chat tab, let us know from where in the world you're joining us today. If you have any specific questions, we do want you to direct those questions to the Q&A tab on the right side of that chat section. Sending in your questions to the Q&A just helps us keep track. And we have time set aside at the end today to go through your questions. So um, be sure to send them in and, and be patient because we will, we will get to them here at the end. Additionally, we'll have two polls that we'll be launching throughout our program. So keep an eye out for those as they pop up. If you jump over to the handout section, you'll see there are a couple of additional resources for you there. So feel free to grab those before we close out. And of course, after we close today, we will be selecting two $50 Amazon gift card winners to those who are the most engaged or fill out our post webinar survey, uh, all criteria that make you eligible for our giveaway. So our topic is optimizing your cloud strategy, achieving flexibility, longevity, and ROI. And I'm joined today by Chris Butler, Senior Solution Architect at Ivan, and Sale Matthews, Senior Cloud Architect 2 at Do IT International. So Chris and Sale, thank you both so much for joining us today on Tech Strong Learning. Chris, do you wanna take us right into our presentation? Sure, absolutely. So uh, welcome everyone to uh, our webinar around cloud strategy optimization topics. Um, we have a lot of material to cover today. Uh, as well as an introduction uh, demo of the Ivan platform. But uh, let's start with further introductions from both Sale and I. Um, I am Chris Butler, a senior partner solutions architect with Ivan. And uh, I've worked in software industry as a developer, a consultant, and a sales engineer for close to 28 years. Much of that time spent in the AI ML space with a specific focus on the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, one of the great aspects of working with partners like I do now is of course, getting to meet subject matter experts that are in the field. So with that, I will pass uh, introductions over to Sale Matthews, one of the great partners I get to work with. Yes, everybody, my name is Sale Matthews. I work for Do It International. I'm a cloud architect here. Before do it, I've kind of done it all. I was a Linux systems administrator, a developer for, I mean, probably about 15, 20 years. I've done everything from running network cable, done to pretty much done it all. And I'm just a very avid kind of advocate of the cloud computing. And currently I've been doing a lot of BigQuery work and I've been a BigQuery subject matter expert here at Do It. And if you've worked with Do It before, you've probably run across some of my blog entries or some webinars I've done in the past. And so with that said, I'll just pass it on here on to Chris for continuing on. Yep, great. Thank you, Sale. Uh, let's go over a quick uh, glimpse as to what we're going to cover today. So we'll start with a brief introduction of Ivan and uh, I'll let Sale introduce some of the services and the functions that do it uh, has as uh, both reseller and systems integrator partner of ours. Um, then we'll jump into the core of the content. And we're going to start with um, what is BYOC? Uh, I'll, I'll reveal the acronym. It means bring your own cloud and how you can integrate this as a strategic imperative into your own cloud strategy roadmap. Uh, then we'll go into a customer story and gain some insights into how a customer of Ivan's has uh, built their cloud strategy around this initiative for sustainable growth, for having a global presence uh, for their real-time streaming needs. Um, after that, 
I will jump over into a actual demo of our Ivan console, uh, show you some of the services I have up and running. I have an IoT use case I'm going to show off today where we'll look at our Kafka service, our Flink real-time streaming data processing service, as well as ClickHouse, and maybe jump into a little bit of our observability stack as well. And then we'll finish off with a forum between Sale and I and uh, any Q&A that you all may have for us towards the end. So without further ado, we'll start off first with a very quick introduction as to Ivan. Maybe some of you are, are familiar with Ivan and the Crab logo. It's a very popular logo if you've seen us at any of the hyperscaler events. Um, we are the trusted open source data platform for everyone, as you can see the uh, badge label says there. And uh, with Ivan's selections of fully managed popular data services, you can see some of them here, such as Kafka, Cassandra, Postgres, and OpenSearch, we help empower customers to focus on making their data applications better while handling the tasks of uh, backups, disaster recovery, we have security and compliance by default, as well as service updates, maintenance upgrades. These are backed by a four nines SLA agreement and constant monitoring of your services. We're going to dive into a larger overview of the Ivan platform, uh, but I'll hand it back over to Sale at this point so he can do, introduce you all to greater detail of Do It. Yes, yeah, so you may have heard of Do It, if not, we are at a high level, a GCP and AWS reseller with a, I should mention a value added reseller and an MSP for both platforms. And our main bread and butter is providing technical advisement and training services to customers, as well as having a SaaS offering, which I hate to use the term SaaS, but <laughs> it is what it is that we use that solution to help you essentially optimize your cloud platform. And, and we are a worldwide company based in Tel Aviv, but we operate in over 70 countries worldwide currently. And here's just a quick overview of our services. Uh, the biggest ones we do are a lot of the helping out with your FinOps, helping you, I'm sort of on the right side here on GCP, we're mostly helping out with senior level cloud architects and engineers like myself. We're helping you provide support and advisement solutions and then we also do a lot of training services to kind of help you get up to speed on the cloud. And then jumping over to the left, which is our kind of our SaaS offering side. Our platform, it gives you a very large suite of cost optimization technology. So you can build reports to visualize your cloud costs. You can map the costs down to figure out what party, what group, what person, et cetera, is costing money and how much money they're spending. As well, we have a cost anomaly or cost spike detection system. And then we also have a budgeting system to allow you to kind of determine how much you want to spend, how much has been wasted on that budget, and when you hit that level. And then next, I want to mention we have a cost optimization, compute cost optimization platform called FlexSave, which exists on AWS that essentially allows you to have CUDs, but on a monthly basis. And it's a very popular system of ours that we provide to all of our customers. And lastly, we have an ISV go-to-market optimization platform for both AWS and GCP. And this next slide here is just kind of a, give you a list of all the certifications we've got. I mean, as you can tell, we've got quite a bit. We've been partner of the year, both worldwide in the US and at different countries around the world for eight times now. And we have a ton of certifications in here. I mean, lots of se very senior level engineers and architects that we handle it all on here. And if you want to see this, and this is kind of describing everything we've got. And I think we can carry on to the next one to go over Ivan's infrastructure. Absolutely. Thank you, Sal, for that introduction. Yep. Um, so Ivan. This is a little bit more of an overview of, of what we have, um, as opposed to that first slide, which was the brief introduction. Uh, and we're really more than just the sum of the open source services that we uh, provide for streaming, for storing, for analytics. 
Um, the platform ensures that all services run reliably and security uh, securely in your choice of, of cloud environment. And we can function cross-cloud as well. I'm sure a lot of you are running in either a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud type of environment. Um, we have observability baked in. You can see some of those functions in the analyze section on this slide, uh, particularly around M3, which is our managed Prometheus uh, service, as well as gaining uh, graphical output and setting up automation triggers through Grafana. Um, the Ivan platform is again, a single control plane for all of your cloud resources. Uh, it is accessible through the console, which is what I'll be demoing today. But if you look at that tooling capability there in the middle of the slide, you'll see that we do have a Terraform provider as well as a Kubernetes operator for those of you who are in DevOps team using infrastructure as code. The console is attached to that key icon in the middle, which is our REST API. And then we provide a Ivan CLI as well for those of you who love to work in X terms and terminal windows. Um, the third party integrations are numerous, probably one of the most popular ones. So I'll give a shout out to uh, two partners here would be um, Datadog and then, of course, Prometheus. Uh, Sale mentioned his expertise in BigQuery. We are a BigQuery ready. Um, uh, partner of Google's, uh, specifically in our Kafka and our Flink offerings. Um, we also have several different compliances. I see a note from Matt. Cody, I don't know if you want to address that, but um, compliance around GDPR, HIPAA, PCI DSS for those FinServe. Um, we'll get into a little bit of more where that responsibility lies when we're talking about BYOC. So if you look at the deployment models there, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in detail as well over the BYOC conversation, but bring your own cloud. What that means is you can deploy to your own infrastructure within your own hyperscaler. Um, again, the four nines are mentioned in here. We have high availability services for most of our plans, starting at even the smaller business plans. And um, yeah, let's move forward. So I mentioned the deployment models. Of course, we've been talking a lot about BYOC already. Um, our standard deployment is direct into Ivan's cloud account. So that's running on our tenant. Uh, and again, you have choices of where you can deploy. We support the three major hyperscalers as well as different OEM options. We have enhanced compliance environments on top of that direct deployment as well. Another thing I'll mention that's not shown here, but we'll go into it on a slide during the BYOC portion, is we are available in the three major hyperscaler marketplaces, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft Azure. Then we have the bring your own cloud. And before we dive into further details, going to hear me say BYOC probably endlessly on, on this uh, webinar, so apologies for that in advance. But this really gives customers great flexibility and not just the deployment, but in how they can manage costs. And then from AWS, we do have the capability to run on AWS Outpost as well. So we'll start here as we begin to dive into uh, more detail around the BYOC discussion. Uh, Sale, did you want to want to put in a note, perhaps? I think I'm good on that. Actually, I just mentioned on your BYOC. Maybe we should mention one thing is well, kind of why you would do BYOC, which I think we're going to be covering a little bit. But generally, you'll use it if you need to have any sort of kind of over beyond regulations or any sort of i would think trying to think of a good term here if you if you're dealing with a need a segregated environment or you have to deal with let's say hipaa or maybe pci dss or maybe military contracts is what we're seeing a lot of if you've got to have extreme security 
where you need absolute control would probably be the best bet to mention on why you would need BYOC. And again, we will cover significantly more on this here in just a little bit. Yep. Great. Thank you for that. Yep. Um, so our BYOC deployment follows a shared responsibility model. Uh, of course, that model is spread even in the standard deployment as well. But in BYOC, there's a bit more of a responsibility in the infrastructure layer that the customer becomes responsible for. So in the BYOC model, Ivan and the customer share the responsibility for the availability, security, and compliance needs, as well as the ongoing operations of the solution that you put into place. Ivan defines that service management and delivery infrastructure, and we provide service deployment, management of that service, as well as any life cycle services. So that could be uh, maintenance on the systems. It could be uh, moving you to newer, more stable, more feature-rich versions of the specific open source data service that you have running. We ensure just naturally, that's part of the compliance by default, that the services are secure and resilient, and we support all of the services. And you get the consistency from whether you're direct, whether you're marketplace, whether you're BYOC, that experience and our level of support doesn't change. In the BYOC deployment, though, the customer is responsible for setting and managing accountant resource permissions, monitoring resource quotas and scalability, maintaining security and compliance of your cloud environment, which is a little bit of what Sale is alluding to, where that could be an advantage, and ensuring that your services are resilient and tested regularly. So the next slide here is an imaginary example, but we're we're using it to kind of describe the cost saving opportunity. And of course, that depends a lot on your cloud infrastructure discounts. On the left-hand side, of course, this is what BYOC is going to give you as uh, sort of those key components that you would be investigating to have control over. So the need to satisfy strict data governance or legal requirements, of course, the ease of network setup and controls. You control your own VPCs, you control your own cloud, so you get that level of functionality that you control there as well. You have the capability, essentially, a lot of people will move to look for it to consolidate their billing when you combine marketplace with a BYOC implementation. Again, services are fully managed and supported by Ivan. And then if we go back to that graphic where you're looking at kind of this imaginary cost differential, when you're factoring in your cost savings plan, any CUDs, do its capability in AWS with their flex save option, several other billing and, and pricing features. It allows you to really save the money um, that we would be paying the hyperscaler on your compute networking and infrastructure storage cost or data needs. Yeah, and Chris, I'll chime in as well. One thing to also consider when you're doing this is if you're using a reseller, when you're using Ivan's inter interface in here and their services, if you are able to do that through the marketplace offering, as well as your BYOC, you can combine your everything on a single bill through your reseller as well, or through the cloud provider. And that will give you a single bill, make it much easier to see your total costs instead of having to jump from, let's go one console to the next console to the other to see where everything is costing. And as well as if you have any sort of costs that are available to you through the cloud provider or reseller that apply to marketplace offerings or to the actual, I guess to your actual infrastructure costs, they can be applied here as well, specifically on the BYOC model. Perfect. Flex such as do its flex save would be another example on that. Great. And we have another poll that is up. Of course, I am checking off most of these because I do use all of them, but uh, hopefully that doesn't skew the results. 
So let's move on to the next slide. So here we're going to talk about a little bit of the marketplace and BYOC play together, the better together story, right? So understand that what you're looking at on the left hand column, the marketplace column there, that's specific to marketplace. When you push this into BYOC, you're combining the two um, uh, points together. So think of it as about a sum total when you go with the better together. If for the sake of understanding, well, maybe I want to start with Ivan in the marketplace, you can understand what we have, have here. Um, again, the difference at the top, primarily from a deployment standpoint, we're deploying that into our cloud account, but you're using that hyperscaler's uh, VMs. Um, in BYOC, it goes into your own controlled customer's cloud account. Payment, the Ivan spend is consolidated into one bill from the cloud provider or a reseller such as Doit with the hyperscaler. So that billing is reported still through your marketplace billing ID. For the BYOC component, you're getting the bill from Ivan strictly around the services that you're running. And then you're paying the hyperscaler for those infrastructure costs, such as you're probably doing today. Again, on AWS only, you can utilize Doit's FlexSave product for infrastructure costs and savings as well. And we already mentioned about the payment to Ivan for the managed services. And you have the choice to do it either directly or via marketplace. Obviously, if you're combining these two together, it would be through marketplace. Otherwise, you would get the bill straight from Ivan. The cost, and again, this is around efficiency. So even within uh, uh, marketplace, you do have the capability to burn down those commits with your cloud provider or reseller for the cost of the Ivan services. Additionally, with BIYOC, so if we're thinking of compounding these initiatives together, you then get to burn down initial costs that you pay for infrastructure. One important note is you're not able to obtain those discounts of the hyperscaler alone towards third-party products and marketplace. However, you can use the hyperscaler discounts towards your existing infrastructure. And then again, the compliance. We do have standard com Ivan compliance. That stays intact. But if you have additional compliance needs or stricter uh, governance requirements, those can be fulfilled much easier in the BYOC area. And Sale, I don't know if you have anything to add to this slide. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let me I actually, is a reseller side of things, I'll mention on it the commits here and how many times if you've decided you want to commit to a cloud to either AWS or GCP, for instance, you say, I want to spend X amount of money with it over one year or three years or five years, depending on the term. They're going to have a amount you must spend that amount but by the end of it if you don't you owe them that much money and a lot of times they will throw in a clause in there saying we'll apply 30 percent or 20 percent of marketplace offerings towards that which would be taken care of by ivan's offerings here through the marketplace but as well as then if when you have your vms and everything else that's running for your infrastructure that would apply to that commit as well and that would be the infrastructure costs that go towards that commit. And then, so since you're getting more towards it, but when you're in marketplace, you only get a percentage. But the good news is that a lot of the cloud vendors have actually relented and allowed you to use a percentage of that marketplace towards it. Because if there was for a time there, they weren't allowing any of it. So they've kind of changed that. And then is mentioned earlier, if you do BYOC, you can hop on, do its flex save product, which as mentioned is essentially a way to have VMs at the cost of CUD prices, but on a month to month basis. So it really helps out here and it will definitely move forward in helping you burn down your commits as well. And as I mentioned before, it's, it could be a single bill sort of operation when you do both of these. All right, go for it, Chris, pass back to you. Good deal, thank you, Sal. So Ivan's three areas of cost optimization and, uh, you know, here, so we're getting a, a little bit deeper into the strategy. We're going to discuss some more points around these cost op optimization topics during our forum session. Uh, but uh, BYOC is just one element in cost optimization that we can provide. 
Um, obviously, we've covered, you know, having greater control of your infrastructure through our BYOC deployment model, as well as the hyperscaler savings plans that get, can be applied to the infra that Ivan is running on. What is this impact? We've seen anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. That's a uh, rough estimate, of course, and, and a, a fairly wide range. It's obviously dependent on the sizes of machines for your services that you need, as well as the type of data ingress and egress that you'll be experiencing during those um, peak load times, for instance. Um, around open source service usage. Uh, so all of our services are pure open source. We actually have an OSPO, an open source program office, where we employ uh, many developers across all of the services that are primary contributors to Apache Kafka, to OpenSearch, to Apache Cassandra, Postgres, MySQL. Um, there's no end user license agreements that you sign when you are committing or spinning up Ivan services um, because we don't, we're running under Apache licenses for each of those services. So, real added bonus I know that open source probably two decades ago, people were fearful of it, but has really taken a hold as an area where companies can find greater cost value. They're wanting to move away from a self managed environment. With Ivan having that open source, quote unquote, vanilla offering, uh, little to no code changes are required in your applications to interface with our services that are running. You have communications across clouds, and I'll show a little bit about how easy it is to move services around in a cloud or even create replications uh, specifically around Kafka and Mirror Maker, for instance, in having a multi cloud regional presence in different clouds, right? So we'll look at that as well, but that's a key component to the platform uh, around our elasticity and flexibility when it comes to deploying the actual services. Um, you can enter long-term agreements with us and, and receive, of course, better pricing. I think that's worth mentioning. Um, we are involved in areas of engagement around proactively right sizing. And then we lean on our great resellers and SI experts such as Do It, such as Sale, to help bring that multi cloud expertise, to discuss tuning, to actually discuss uses of services, specific use cases, which we're going to dive into a little bit of that in our forum around ClickHouse. Um, you get great influence on the product product roadmap as well. So that's unique to us. While a lot of these services are available natively in certain hyperscalers, uh, we like to think that we deliver more of a white glove experience and giving you actual influence on those open source projects as well. Yeah, Chris, and I'll expand on that as well. Just give a quick note that one of the biggest things coming from do it that we do both gcp and aws and a lot of cross cloud kind of consulting and advisement is the multi cloud is just phenomenal to have if you're able to say run mysql on aws and gcp at the same time doing the cross cloud replication to keep things going in both houses essentially that is you cannot understand how amazing that is just because a lot of customers need to do that, and it's very, very complex to do on your own simply because you're competing with different products that are trying to get across there. You need a standardized way to communicate between the two clouds. You can set up egress, egress and deal with the cost of that, and there's just a lot involved there. But so I can't even begin to understate how much it, this is, how great this is, and how much it helps out to be able to get this multi cloud across there just because. Multi-cloud is pretty much the future. You don't want to lock into a single vendor nowadays. As we've seen a lot this year with a bunch of customers just jumping between the different clouds. And so can't even begin to state just how well and how great this is to be able to go across the clouds so easily as well. And even if you're migrating, it's a good way to do the migration as well. Yep, absolutely. And and uh, 
I think we have that in our specific uh, customer yeah, so, story yeah. as well that we're going to talk about. But that's great, Sal. Thank you for that. Input. Yeah. Much appreciated. So we'll end up with a, a final summary of BYOC benefits for you. Lower TCO, of course, that's a primary driver these days. Uh, we understand that, but we also want you to get the full benefits of your cloud infrastructure deals. So any of those CUDs, any of those commit deals that you have, know that you can really um, gain that burn down control by uh, going with an Ivan BYOC deployment. Keeping your data under strict compliance control, strict security needs, uh, on top of our already existing um, security by default, compliance by default. And yeah, you get to enjoy your managed experience in your own cloud environment. So again, that experience of using the Ivan console, uh, the Terraform scripts that you may need to spin up infrastructure, CLI, REST API embedded into your own applications, all of that is consistent no matter where you deploy with Ivan. And again, you're we're still handling the, the details of the provisioning. Any kind of scaling is done through the management plane. And with those 4.9 SLA, we're monitoring and, and probably the best added benefit is your data stays under your control. So let's jump into the next part. We're gonna get into some more fun here before I jump into the demo and I'm being conscious of time. But we're going to start with a uh, narrative that we built out around one of our customers. Uh, and this narrative is available uh, as a customer story on our public website at ivan.io. Um, it involves Priceline. So uh, the customer showed us a very high propensity for leveraging open source data services as well as a strong desire to move to the cloud for resilient real-time streaming capabilities that could be supported on a global scale. Um, they were running Kafka on-prem and it had proven not only costly, but it lacked flexibility that they needed to deliver on these global deployment requirements. So uh, Priceline chose Ivan for Kafka, Kafka Connect, Mirror Maker, and open search to support their evolution towards an event-driven architecture. Now, with a globally distributed view of pricing and listings worldwide, what does this mean? Well, it means that Priceline has the capability to personalize interactions to meet customer preferences, for instance. Um, they were able to deliver deals to customers in real time. This is probably the most important one, right? Regardless of their origin. And what does this do? This retains customers for the long term, right? By moving to Ivan for Apache Kafka, Priceline realized $1 million in total cost of ownership savings. And then we'll jump into a little bit of this reference architecture that we have here. And uh, Priceline on their cloud is using, using GCP. So you'll see a lot of native services here and, and uh, understand that that's part of our flexibility and capabilities in our integration layer. So as a retail, as a travel, online travel agency customer, um, uh, the solution essentially shows how Ivan not only fills a gap in, in uh, real-time streaming that they had, but it allows for seamless connections to some of these Google native services that are shown here, such as BigQuery, Google Cloud Storage. Uh, you know, Therefore, driving more data to these services to kind of understand those long-term customer purchasing behaviors. Uh, with Mirror Maker 2 running on Ivan, you know, sales mentioned the capability to have kind of this distribution mechanism for replication spread across globally and easily with a platform like Ivan. Priceline achieves that global distribution of their real-time streaming architecture that is powering these uh, real-time pricing updates and driving better offers to a uh, already existing 
and hopefully loyal customer base. Um, and according to our champion, you saw a quote there, and I think I pulled another quote here for just verbalizing today on this webinar. Ivan is one of those key partners in their data strategy, and they're currently uh, uh, looking at future growth with us around AI pipelines that can be powered by vector search capabilities, not just in PG vector, but uh, we give you a choice with uh, vector database storage uh, with availability of that type of use case in both open search and ClickHouse and soon to be released down the line in Apache Cassandra as well. So without further ado, and we'll come back to some of these topics and the realization around these cloud strategies in our forum session, but I'm going to jump over into a demo of the Ivan platform. And uh, we'll keep this brief because I do want to have uh, time to have some greater discussions around what brought you here today. So a quick introduction of the Ivan platform. Here you're seeing a console. I had built up a uh, quick project uh, where I'm, I'm doing some IoT. So if you can imagine, for those of you who are data scientists or have had any exposure to that realm in your jobs or are just curious about it, um, I have gotten data from the UC Irvine data sets. We're looking at air quality data. So if you can imagine, there's air quality sensors that are distributed out uh, in, in cities, in countries, and they're sending this data to a producer who is then passing on those messages with the air quality data uh, ingested into Kafka. We probably should start with uh, some of the integration endpoints that are available to you as an Ivan customer. So you can configure external integration points with any of these services. Obviously, I mentioned Datadog up front. We create an endpoint for Datadog. If you want to store any of the information into an external open search or an external Postgres to get data flowing, you can do that as well by setting up an endpoint here. A lot of these endpoints are based on observability at this time. So we support Prometheus as well. That's a popular one that we work with. Around the Prometheus op option, I'll jump into M3 really quickly. Through M3, if you're scraping all of your logs from Prometheus and you want to have a long-term storage option for observability, we have in our M3 service the ability to enable Prometheus write on your Prometheus endpoint config, start sending those to Prometheus as well. And then you can see down here, I'm sending metrics to Grafana to have that visibility of what's going on. So I have a graphical output. When you're going to create a service in Ivan, and we'll start with Kafka since Kafka is kind of the core of this project. Again, you have the option to select from a cloud provider. You would select a specific region. And what this price is reflective of is uh, we have transparent pricing. So when you're deploying directly on Ivan or Ivan in the marketplace, we are covering your cost of your data ingress, egress, your VPC peering. Your plan increases based on the size of what we're paying back to the hyperscaler for the VM. But essentially you have the flexibility to place this in any cloud region you want on any cloud. You would choose a business plan according to your throughput or data storage needs. On Kafka, we could also add additional storage and you would want to give it a good name so that you could track that service in your observability suite as well. And once that service is up and running, I have full access to a lot of capabilities here, even within the um, Ivan Kafka uh, service itself. We support schema registry through Carapace. You'll see Carapace mentioned here as well. Our Kafka topics support Avro, Protobuf, JSON. 
Um, we'll look at us at the other options as well for storing that when I jump topic. Um, really, the simplicity. I think Sale was 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 trying to invoke how easy it is to move these services around or to downsize or upsize. To change a plan, I could move to a different plan. I could trigger these things through Terraform scripts as well. If you want to have infrastructure as code automated in there, click change. Your existing service stays up. We do the DNS mapping. We're having a short TTL on that. So it switches over in a matter of five seconds once the new service is up. No changes are needed for your application. And you still have, again, that access running uh, for your producers and consumers to be um, sending and ingesting data. Again, on migrating cloud. So if I want to move this service over into Google Cloud, it's a click of a button. I choose my region and I click migrate. Similar process is happening in the back end as it does for the change plan. Five minutes or so later, later, with service availability still intact during that time, the DNS mapping happens and you're running on your new service in your new cloud. Part of this infrastructure is around our Flink offering, right? A lot of data that we get ingested is dirty data. It needs to be pre-processed. We can process in real time with our Flink service. So if I look at our Flink service, I don't know how many people are familiar with that. Right now we support Flink SQL, uh, soon to be released uh, beginning of next year. Some point will be the capability for customers to upload their own custom jars. So we will support UDFs at that time. But for now, you can create applications in here that help us transform data. And I have a transformation running that is kind of bringing my date and time separated values into a distinct timestamp. I'm zeroing out some of my bad read data as well. Probably not a good way to do it in real life, but uh, that's what I've done here for the sake of demoing. And I'm pushing this into another Kafka topic running on that same service. Once I have this running, and this will start teeing up some of the conversations Sale and I are going to have around uh, ClickHouse and running analytics and cost associated with that. ClickHouse is an analytics warehouse. It's extremely fast. So my Kafka is connected to this ClickHouse service. And I have generated materialized views for that. We can go and look at these views and tables that are stored either directly from my Kafka service or in my default ClickHouse database. And then with that data, I can start running some interesting functions. So maybe I want to understand uh, correlations between temperature and relative humidity and how that might impact uh, ozone uh, outputs in this case. So we'll run this query really quickly. And again, this is for the sake of demo. This isn't probably good practice statistics going on here, but it runs a Pearson correlation to see what my relationship between these two variables are broken out dependent on a month and year conversion. So I'm doing a group by based on that date, time, timestamp. Uh, I can see some strong correlations dependent on the month. Um, that's great. You can also perform um, the traditional methods of, uh, of regression. So ClickHouse has functions that are part of deploying a stochastic linear or stochastic logistic regression model into ClickHouse. Once I have those models deployed again with basic um, SQL to create a table that has that model attached to my data, I can now run a prediction using that model, my stochastic linear regression model and execute on that and see what is the predicted value going to be. So I obviously would not want to use the data I trained this with, which is all I have at this point in time, but I would use future data points. So a really powerful tool for doing forecasting predictive analytics in.
Chris, one thing to mention, though, you may want to, we also want to mention that this is ClickHouse doing this in real time as well. Correct. And ClickHouse is extremely fast, especially if you come from the Redshift or BigQuery worlds. And how this query may take, looking at models, it may take 20, 30 seconds to run there, whereas ClickHouse can run this in less than a second as well, like we just did. Yep, high, highly performant. And I don't have a ton of rows of data, but milliseconds over over 10,000 rolls. But I think you found an article sale around petabytes. Different. Yes, oh yeah. B this will just run circles around most of their data warehouses on speed if it's optimized correctly that it could run these statistical methods just, I mean, just stupidly fast for lack of a better term. And it's phenomenally fast on this as well. Absolutely. So why don't sale you and I now we can jump into our form and then we'll take some uh, Q and A from uh, those of you who are who are still with us and and watching. But let's jump over into some of the discussions that Sale and I wanted to have about about the topics that we talked about today. So Sale, I know you have some uh, uh, some opinions about uh, implementing a CDC strategy. Yeah, so, so definitely, I mean, if you're not familiar with CDC, it's essentially change data capture. Thank you. Insert a row here, and it needs to replicate out to another database. And it's a very common way to do migrations or being able to create a copy or replica of a database. For instance, maybe you're doing reporting and you've got a reporting read replica you want to read from, or even dropping data from say Postgres, you want to put it into your data warehouse, whether that's ClickHouse or BigQuery or Redshift. That's a very, very common th uh, process to do these days. And one of the big things that we've actually seen quite a bit of over the past year has been for customers to spread that out across clouds or even across regions. And particularly the prime example that I was actually discussing with some colleagues this morning on a podcast was that the Paris floods of earlier this year, when it completely wiped out one of Google's data centers there. And a lot of customers that had set it for that specific region lost their data just because it was gone completely. And they, because they had not replicated it out. And a lot of those customers are now looking at ways to replicate their data across clouds or even across regions. So CDC, a lot of times, is the best way to do that. And for instance, using Ivan's offering, if a big one, if you wanted Postgres and you wanted to replicate your data to another Postgres instance, say if you're on GCP currently, you want to put on AWS. It's extremely easy to do. It just uses the PG logical replication and can push it across. But one thing that we also see a lot of other customers want to do is that we want to go Postgres to, say, maybe BigQuery or maybe Redshift as well. And what they do is they set up, usually set up Kafka with Kafka Connect using a tool called Debezium in there. They can actually transform that data and insert it into, call it the service XYZ at the downside of it, which could be BigQuery, could be a flink could be a pub sub topic, maybe a kinesis topic or to redshift even. And that's a very common thing we're seeing now is that customers want to get their data across clouds or to just, I would say, a generic destination. That's a very, very common thing we see nowadays. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, you reminded me of something I forgot to show. If we look in our Kafka service specifically around the connectors that are available, and one thing to note about our Kafka service is we don't charge you for connectors. So that price you saw when I was spinning up a service, that's the price you pay for the service. You get to use the connectors for free as well as uh, we don't, we don't, charge you for messages or topics either. But if I go into the connector section here as well, um, let me hide my screen here. Gotta love doing a live demo, right? <laughs> oh, Never fails, never fails, okay. Never never fails. Anyway, we have connectors. We have, I wanna say 30 plus, uh, Debezium, 
is supported across most major SQL implementations, MongoDB, uh, MS SQL Server, as well as Postgres and MySQL. And then there's a JDBC connector. Um, being BigQuery ready, we have those source and sync connectors for BigQuery, as well as Google PubSub. So around that Kafka initiative, it's pretty interesting because um, we have customers who are using both Kafka and PubSub on the GCP side. They're using PubSub for that near real-time or longer-term type of subscription analysis that you need and really doing the real-time analytic automation or building out event-driven architectures through um, Kafka. So a lot of options there as well. So let's move forward a little bit with the conversation sale around okay. the uh, ClickHouse cost versus BigQuery cost. So okay. Definitely. You know, I, I don't I don't personally see it as a wholesale replacement, right? You you probably no, want to, to kind of look at your use cases for doing some quick forecasting, some analytics on doing statistical correlations like what I was doing. It it really has a different niche from my perspective. But what can you comment on what you've been seeing from customers and what you've been playing around with ClickHouse and and kind of the performance around that? Yeah, definitely. So I was actually having this discussion earlier today is that they were, I believe some study came out that said that most people, when they do their data analysis, they look at data that's between zero and 90 days old. And once you get beyond that point, you really don't look at the data anymore. And so keeping that in mind, BigQuery is just really good for storing massive amounts of data. And a lot of our customers, we see them using BigQuery for doing that, but then they look at, they got 60 days of data and they're like, well, after that, we don't really use it anymore. And when you do BigQuery, it's kind of, it's gotten a little bit more expensive and it takes a lot of time to do some of these more analytical queries. So one thing that we're seeing a lot of customers doing is, I wouldn't say a lot, we've seen a number of customers doing and more exploring this option now that costs are becoming a big factor is, how about we look at other services? How about we load this data out of BigQuery, say into ClickHouse or some sort of, for instance, the time series database as well is a big one. So like InfluxDB, that they load the data in and they perform specialized queries on these additional services like ClickHouse. Whenever they've got to do analytics across 90 days, they load the 90 days up into ClickHouse, run tons of operations on them, get that data and then present that out, which then kind of leads into an in other interesting topic that I'm actually in the middle of writing a blog entry with, with a lot of help from Chris here, is about fronting BigQuery for visualization services. So for instance, you have Looker, Tableau, or anything along those lines, that those do a lot of querying and they need to do querying fast to present data. Right. And the querying fast, as great as BigQuery is for churning through petabytes of data, it's not very fast at doing that. Whereas ClickHouse is when Chris ran those queries earlier, I mean, it was just there immediately, snap your fingers and the data is there. On a lot of queries, that's the case. So one model that I've kind of proposed, and I've seen a few customers use this to great success is to load your data into ClickHouse and then hook up your Looker, your Tableau, your business objects, what have you, to Looker instead of BigQuery and perform your SQL queries against ClickHouse and just get immediate results. And then as a side note on that, since they're completely different models, whereas ClickHouse is more of a pay for a single instance sort of model versus BigQuery's pay for usage, you're actually paying less per query in theory, of course, but in general, you're going to on ClickHouse by running all your queries against ClickHouse with your performance gains and then having BigQuery in the back end of being your data warehouse that does your big processing and maybe runs your monthly reports or does, if you're doing any sort of like ledger operations, you can do all your big jobs there, but having ClickHouse as your utility or your cache or your front end, whatever you want to call it, that feeds all your data to all your reporting services. 
And I mean, that's the big one we talked about. I know Chris and I talked about that yeah. quite a bit. And that's, I would say that is probably where ClickHouse is probably going to see a lot of usage going forward, especially after all the changes in BigQuery back in July as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the other areas that we want to discuss was around open source messaging, but yeah. I think we could maybe apply this to, I, I see one Q&A question in our Q&A section. Um, Cody, I don't know if you want to present that question or not, but I can read it as well. It's up to you. But uh, the question was asked, uh, considering the dynamic nature of technology, how do you recommend organizations future-proof their cloud strategy for long-term success? Which so, of yeah. course, what we're talking about here. Yeah, right? I mean, I think that goes very close to some of the questions we prepared for you all as well. I, absolutely. So I, I, I think I would start uh, to the uh, person who posted that question. And thank you for, for asking. Um, I think open source provides a really unique opportunity in partially answering that. Um, when you're looking at proprietary solutions, right, you're dependent on the health and growth of that, that organization to sustain, to add more features, to continue to service your needs, to continue to exist as a, as a company. And I think the prevalency of open source and organization is because of the millions of contributors that are, that are out there. And um, you have a little bit more around the kind of dynamic nature. I would say that open source tends to just move a little bit more cautiously from my experiences. I, I, I was at one point in time, I'm not anymore, but I was a Django contributor in the Python community. And uh, there's a lot of deliberation that goes on into what you're changing how and the nature of pull requests and et cetera. And that's more of kind of an anecdotal answer to that question. But to me, it really hones in on the value of open source technologies. Again, with a platform like Ivan, you're getting this fully managed. So you don't have to have that expertise in what it means to run them, only that developer experience in using those. So that would be partially how I would answer it. So I don't know if you want to add more color because you're obviously in that implementation world, uh, you know, head first. So oh, yeah, how definitely. would you answer that that question? I would definitely say one thing to look at, like how Chris just mentioned about open source is I would even go as, take that a step further and say that using open source kind of prevents you from getting locked into a specific vendor. Is we've seen over the past I guess, two years now with a, one unnamed cloud provider, how a lot of the products are canceled pretty often and how a lot of customers are just kind of left in the cold with a lot of those operations. And they're now having to real quickly pivot and jump into other things. And we've seen this even pre-cloud. I mean, I can't even tell you how many of old database solutions or th other things we've used over the day. Like for instance, like back in the day, I was having a conversation with a buddy over the weekend about Fox Pro, if anybody ever remembers that, which was an old database solution that Microsoft bought back in the 90s. Right. Great, great database, but it disappeared in lieu of access coming out. And you're at the mercy of vendors when you do this. And unfortunately, I mean, sure, you get some of the big things like Cloud Pub Sub, Google Cloud Pub Sub, you get like Kinesis on AWS. Those are probably not going to go away. But the problem is then you're talking about having to communicate between the two you've got to kind of figure out a way to do that and that they're not going to ever create a, a way it's like android and iphone you're not going to ever have a good way to communicate and the companies are not going to come together to their competitors but if you're able to choose an agnostic view of things such as open source that provides a good bridge between the platforms that you can then communicate without having to build your own solution or purchase something else in addition, just to do simple communications. And that would be my, the biggest thing I would say is to choose things that are open, that are going to be around, preferably 
open source, just because open, like Chris mentioned, open source is pretty conservative going forward. Is things are not going to just disappear. Somebody's going to pick it up and probably run with it for some of the larger products. And I would highly recommend for going forward to future proof, open source is a good way to go and choosing an open platform to kind of base everything on so that way you're not locked into a specific technology that may go away next year. Right. And I'm looking at the clock and see that we are getting close to the end here. So Absolutely. I, will, I will let it rest on that one real quick. And I see we don't have any other Q&As. And Cody, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to throw in at the end here. I just wanted to give Chris the opportunity to leave us with any parting words as well before I start shutting this down. Oh, gosh. You know, uh, no, no more pitching for me. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Um, Really, it's we understand the the value of your time and taking this much time out of your morning, afternoon, and evening is a big commitment on your part. And uh, Sale and I appreciate that. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and thank you everybody for attending. And hey, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn about our respective companies, or if you see some services that you like and want to discuss some more, feel free to reach out to either of us. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Chris and Sale, thank you both so much for joining us today on Tech Strong Learning. It's been such a packed hour and we, we filled every minute plus one. So for everyone here, thank you so much for being late to your next meeting. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank Appreciate you guys. It. Have a good one, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So a couple of things for our audience, just a reminder that we have been recording. You will be receiving that recording via email here shortly. It'll also be living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars, and it will be in the on-demand section. Like I said at the top of the hour, we will be selecting two $50 Amazon gift card winners. So keep an eye out to uh, potentially be one of those winners. I'd like to thank Ivan for sponsoring our program today. And to everyone here, thank you so much for your time. We hope to see you at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day.